Campbell. There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio with the one, the only Julian Ponson. Julian, what is up, my brother? How are you? <laughs> I'm I'm wonderful because uh, I'm I'm in Peru in in a very high frequency environment, out of the matrix, away from the insanity, uh, where I can actually uh, hear the spirits more clearly, where it's uh, much more easy to tune into what we could consider a cosmic stream to be in alignment with what we truly are. And I guess uh, we will dance, um, let's say, in the stream today because we're, we're going to speak about how to become natural <laughs> because we have forgotten what that is actually like as a species, yeah, how to und undo the amnesia of our original origin. Um, but I, I'm going to give a little bit of a background, uh, let's say, who I am on the level of appearances, even though it's ultimately illusion. But <laughs> the realm let's speak of the about, Maya. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's speak about the co coordinates in, in Maya, in the matrix, in, in the holographic illusion that we're here experiencing. So if I give some co coordinates, uh, I used to work as a psychotherapist in, in Germany, but I had a spiritual awakening uh, that led to complete ego death. It was basically the dying down of all psychological activity where I realized my timeless nature. I was completely thoughtless and emotionless and without suffering probably for weeks where I maybe had four thoughts a day. <laughs> this was like the maximum. <laughs> and after that, uh, slowly through continuous meditations, I began rem remembering past life, past lives. And uh, the initial one that sparked basically my own reinitiation into who I am was remembering of being a Zen Buddhist teacher in Japan. So um, suddenly I would remember a, a whole system of realization and yoga where I would go through the process again and begin like radiating or transmitting that to those who are uh, who were interested or in resonance with it. And I've now moved to Peru because with a team of spiritual practitioners, we want to build a monastery where we preserve mystical teachings and those mystical teachings that we're going to present there, they reach back to Atlantis, to Egypt. Um, there's a lot of Tibetan Buddhism in there. There's a lot of Japanese Zen in there. And there are definitely a lot of yogic practices in there because these are all the traditions that the souls that I'm working with took part, took part in over, let's say, thousands of years. And here we are undoing the amnesia and trying to assist other beings in undoing the amnesia as well. Beautiful. Um, I have man, many questions to ask you about that and to unpack, but you know, I'll just, you know, real quick again, just talk about your bio. I mean, you basically just told everybody that in the matrix, you were a psychotherapist <laughs> and you woke up and now, and, and again, to credit to you guys or to you, um, I want to share with my audience that Gerald Clark told me about you back in 2017, might've been 2018. It was one of those two years. It was definitely way before the scamdemic happened. And I started following you. I started researching you. Uh, and reading some of your work and obviously watching some of your podcasts. And I was profoundly moved and inspired. And I have honestly been wanting to do this for a long time. So humbly and uh, very privileged, uh, I'm grateful to have you here today. So, you know, let me just say to the universe, uh, this is a very good uh, communion uh, because a lot of greatness is going to come out of this work here today. But um, let me just ask you, because I like to do this now. And again, for the purposes of this podcast today is April 6th, 2023. Uh, the timelines are converging. We are now in a very seriously quantum um, community uh, for even the people that don't understand what that means. But again, you know, my audience is pretty tuned in. Are you right now thinking that whatever is to come, 
And again, I know time is made up that outside of this duality, third dimensional paradigm of the matrix that it doesn't even exist. But are you of the mindset based on your intuition and based on your, you know, introspection and meditation, how close are we to whatever is to come, you know, and, and I, and let's just say for whatever is to come is some sort of a convergence where there's a, you know, a bifurcation where the resonant, you know, go a specific way and the dissonant go a specific way. And again, I know you can define it a million different ways from that, but like, in your opinion, like how close are we? So what you're basically asking me directly is about like the manifestation that is going to occur and what is it going to look like? Well, th that's a very challenging question because, uh, question because uh, many psychics, w when they make these type of inquiries, uh, you will hear uh, different versions of it or angles on it. First of all, depending on their own karma, can they truly detect what is going to happen or do they have shadow aspects where they are unconscious where they're distorting the information <laughs> um, so that that's a challenging one and then also that in the way that we experience time let's say if i would make a psychic inquiry right now and i would go into meditation and ask a, a being uh, on a very very high level to give me a vision about what's going to happen This is an inquiry that has to do with the energy right now. So if we do any type of prediction, energy can shift. Yeah. So we can only look at the energy as it is. And from that, make a prediction. And there's certain probabilities. Mm -hmm. Like you, you can say that certain events, for example, when, when there is a certain threshold of energy reach, that they have a probability of, for example, 95% occurring. Right. But there's always the uncertainty principle. Right, because things can shift. People can wake up or stay right. asleep, and so on. But um, if you ask me about, let's say, a vision of the future of where we are going, this is something that I actually experienced in in, in Germany, and I was going through some discernment process. We actually found out, and you probably have witnessed that too, that in the spiritual community there was nearly a fifty fifty split about yeah. the so called pandemic, where like fifty percent of the spiritual practitioners said, well taking a certain popular injection is fine and it's absolutely not fine. And we can speak about why it's not fine at some point. If, uh, if you want to know why it's not fine, of course, but the interesting thing is that even though psychics were receiving very different information, depending on what, what they would tune into based on their own bias. But the entity that I asked was a, a Hindu deity that was Kali. And I chanted her mantra. I went into a, a trance and I shared mind with her. And what she, what she showed me was haunting. Yeah. The first thing that I saw, basically, that she showed me earth from the night side. And usually you see all the urban areas. You see, you, you see the, the lights from the cities. And she, she basically was speeding that up time-wise. And I could see how the urban areas were shrinking and shrinking and becoming smaller and smaller. And the next thing that she showed me was basically the sound of ambulances, nonstop ambulances going up and down the street and an eerie silence following after that. Next, let's say scene, we teleported like remote viewing, if you yeah, will, we sure. remote viewed a hospital in the future with hundreds of people dying. Yeah. And I could see the dark nanoparticles uh, and some sort of black goo running through their nervous system and their yeah. blood vessels. And uh, it was difficult to watch, but this is one side of the story. The next thing that, that she showed me was that nature was claiming back the urban areas. Right. And after that, she gave me a glimpse of, a new earth community after the collapse of the Western civilization, which again is Atlantis 2.0. And you sure. can get into that if you want. Of course. So she showed me the collapse. And then she showed me that there are a lot of small communities of survivors that are deeply spiritual, but high tech at the same time. So she showed me one of these communities. We went in there and all the teenagers, they were like meditating in public, in the, in the marketplaces. And they were beings of light that were actually there and were teaching people telepathically. That's awesome. And people had no fear about that. So you're saying we, we, we can finally throw these in the water? <laughs> yeah, throw what in the water? <laughs> the, the screens. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they have their purposes for, for as long yeah. as they're part of the matrix, we can use them in reverse. We're using them right now. Use, yeah. yeah. 
any yeah. technology that's used against you, you can use it in reverse. And it's right. in the same way, even if we experience, let's say, negative entities and demonic forces, uh, we can use any catalyst in a positive manner. Yeah. Correct. So no need to be afraid. Amazing stuff, man. Um, beyond that, well, so I love the fact that you saw high tech because I think a lot of people you know, in the spiritual communities, because I think a lot of people like us, you know, realize again, the bifurcation is happening and that eventually people like us will have to go off the grid because again, you know, whatever you want to refer to the metaverse or the AI or the transhumanist beast system, whatever it is that they're building, you know, none of us are going to plug into that, right? Like, I mean, you know, they're obviously now talking about the financial collapse, the engineered to some sort of, you know, fed coin or, crypto fed, you know, BS and nobody will have access to that until, unless you're chipped and vaccinated mm -hmm. and enslaved and, you know, uh, monitored social credit system, all of this stuff. So, but when we talk about this and we go deeper into this and we start intuiting, and again, we talk about communities of, uh, you know, resonant beings, uh, you know, soul, true soul, organic fo people, most people think there's no tech, right? That the tech we've just opted out of it. But the fact that you saw the tech in it with beings of light there, that's great because then that means that the, you know, the benevolent ones, however you want to refer to them in the universe, in the cosmos will be here. And, and, and I think Julian, that's kind of our conversation here today. We have a lot of points, but this has always been a battle between light and dark, right? Like I don't even like saying good and evil because that's mm -hmm. more duality because yes. there is no good and evil outside of this dimension, right? If you're coming from a point of observation, everything is value. Every experience you can choose to learn from. So it's really just light and dark. And, and ultimately, if you've read any of the great you know, metaphysicists or philosophers or any of these people who tackled these questions, you, know, you will always come to the point that light is the absence, or I'm sorry, darkness is the absence of light. So at some yes. point the light comes on and there is no darkness. So like, no matter how far deep you go down to the dark side, the parasitic energy, you know, whatever murders or crimes or, you know, child sacrifices or whatever, eating people, whatever it is that the darkest thing that a human can experience, you can still make your way or find your way back to the light. So when you understand that, you know, that the light is always ultimately going to win. And so like, I kind of into it that, that forces of dark, are really Julian, and you know this is one of your talking points, but they're really just playing a role to yes. te to teach us that that's not the game to play. That you know maybe you want to pursue that at some point, but you'll eventually make your way around to realizing that this does not compute. You know, in the long run, from a soul perspective. All right, so there there, there are several things to to address then. Yeah, for example. Um, many beings who are awakening from the metric system, they get into conspiracy facts. <laughs> I'm saying conspiracy facts on purpose uh, to not entertain a certain CIA term. <laughs> but uh, it can very, very quickly become a distraction and it can create a sense of powerlessness if we focus on the dark. What is, it is important to know what they're doing. It is important to know that they are around and it's important to know their methods but at the same time, what we need to focus is, is basically our divine origin and co-creating from a sovereign state that we create a, an alternative timeline for ourselves that is a high-frequency timeline and not a match to, let's say, dark entities or dark AI and dark technology. So uh, the difficulty here is this for many people that when they wake up, they are in a fear state and the and when we are in a fear state, we are actually an energetic match to the system. So in fact, it's much more important to say, well, okay, I've done the diagnosis. Now I stop obsessing over the, over the diagnosis. Now I, now I do the therapy, which is my own spiritual process where I do the inner archaeology that I access my own connection to the creator so I can begin summoning divine light that will magnetize me in such a way that the timeline that I attract is a higher timeline. Because what you are individually experiencing has to do with your own alchemical process. Have you transformed or transmuted, for example, the fear in you or the guilt in you, the shame in you, the judgment in you? Because those energies are actually what are a match to the matrix and a match to the demonic. 
And the demonic is simply mirroring our shadows that we don't have integrated. So right. their job is basically this. They bring us suffering That's right. as a form of evolutionary pressure. So we That's need right. to awaken. That's and right. their job, if I would describe it, their job description is other than God. That's right. Which means they offer you free will. Right. They tell you, well, you can go against God. You can experience yourself as a separate narcissistic entity that's very self-occupied. Sure. With yeah, And I often say, and this is very hard to stomach for people, that the amount of self-centeredness that we have is the amount of fear that we experience. That's right. That's right. Right? So the more fear we experience, the more we are in an ego state and are actually a match to the dark energy. And the point about suffering is that the suffering or the pain is a catalyst to wake us up exactly to right. where we are not in alignment. No? When your tooth hurts, you go, you're, you go to the dentist. If it wouldn't hurt, you wouldn't go to the dentist. So if your soul wouldn't hurt, you wouldn't want to wake up. That's okay? beautifully stated. It's beautiful. Yeah, so I mean, the dark has a role to play, and it's very well, important not to judge the darkness for it because otherwise we become a match to it. I hope that well, makes sense. Well, let's even go deeper on that because – the whole, and obviously we have to speak, you know, in code so that this podcast, this amazing podcast doesn't get deleted. And by the way, in case they do delete it, I'll give you the file and I'll have the file. So they can't delete that. Right. We always have a cosmic print, but here's the thing to what you just said, to go deeper, to go more granular. It's literally like, are you conscious enough to understand that you have free will to say no, that, you know, again, as you said, in the illusion of the Maya, you know, your job, your income, your whatever excuse that you make to, to, to justify you taking the V and the B and everything else that comes with it is not real. And so, like, are you conscious enough to realize that what is real is your spirit? You are, you and I and everyone listening to this is nothing more than a, uh, as I like to say, an oscillating plasmatic discharge the more you're oscillating the higher your vibration right but like the, that, that's all you really are so it's like if you understand that then you're going to say no no matter what because none of the other stuff is real but so many people are literally body conscious only right they're only conscious of their physical experience you know again the illusion their money their cars their jobs their things I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, bro, but it's like the, the, the truth is, is that when you get to a level of awareness where as everything you just said, that the evil slash the parasitic is playing a role to evolve and grow your soul, that you're not even going to make those choices because it's like, oh, it's simple. Like I always say this to people, if, uh, and, and again, for us, in, in case you and I are going kind of meta over the top of some people, and I know that happens, but if, if, if for for those that understand what you just I just said I know you do but for those that don't like if a reptilian being like right now just you know conjugated in front of me Julian as we were mm -hmm. podcasting and it said I'm going to kill you you like I would bend my head over and say hey you know pour some salt on me before you eat me right because like I know it's not real in that I'm not a physical body and that in this mm -hmm. quote unquote experience. I'm an energy form that is essentially eternal and everlasting and infinite. So like, yes. I'm not in fear of any of that. Right. But again, it takes a, what you said, it takes a, a knowing, it takes a level of awareness through inner work, you know, inter, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, introspection, contemplation, meditation, sitting in stillness to get to that level of awakened. And most people, and I shouldn't say most people because people are waking up every second, but the, the good majority are still not at that level of consciousness yet. I mean, again, everyone's that conscious, right? But in the matrix, behind the veil, in the illusion, they haven't gotten there yet, at least. Everybody eventually does or remembers or wakes up or however you want to say it, but like we're all at different levels. I remember the thing you said that, that, stung, that stuck with me for a long time. You said... Um, it's not our job to awaken others. In fact, you said that attempting to awaken others is an act of spiritual violence. I know you said that a long time ago, but I've always remembered that. And so in my communication with people, I never attempt ever, unless they ask me for wisdom and counsel to teach people or to lead people or to proselytize. It's always about sharing when asked to, to share, when asked for counsel, for asked for an opinion or asked for wisdom 
but never to proselytize. And I think in speaking of the different levels of awareness, and again, I've listened to you go very deep on this stuff. Um, there are varying levels of awareness and, and, and it's only when people get through, I think the first two or three that they're now able to receive, you know, a deeper explanation or meaning, but mm -hmm. we all, as you said, many times have to allow them to get there on their own. Well, it, as a metaphor, uh, if, if I would describe it to, to you like this, I recently channeled uh, an, an image that we will use here for, for our spiritual group. And it's basically a yogi who is merging with a lighthouse where the light that comes from the lighthouse is actually uh, emanating from the pineal gland. So, you're, sure. you, so you see what is called a, a halo, which is a, a misrepresentation. It's a sphere. It's right. a sphere that is radiating from a crystallized pineal gland. So our job is to radiate, so to speak. And just the fact that we are radiating a higher frequency energy than what the majority is experiencing, when they get in contact with us, we only have to be authentic. And from that authenticity, they experience inspiration or trigger points within themselves, and they can make a choice to awaken or not and ask those beings who are, have already been to certain stages of initiation uh, for counsel or methods of direct inquiry of how to actually get past the mind that has been, let's say, uh, programmed by reptilian intelligence. <laughs> that's a fact. That's, yeah, that's that a fact that actually dates back to, to Atlantis when you said, oh, the <laughs> reptilian is going to come and eat me up. Well, um. It is about being the example life. And in fact, um, one of the things that, that Buddha did, he did the analysis in spirit when he was watching Earth. He did the analysis of the reptilian consciousness that was activated in the Atlanteans through dark influences. And he was thinking about how can I get them out of the mind prison? And this is when he came down to then go through it himself so he could prove to himself, oh, I can break out of the prison. And then basically did the diagnosis, the diagnosis and developed the therapy of how to get past the mind. Yeah. And the main thing of awakening is to step out of the mind because if we do not step out of the mind and if we do not use our nervous system in reverse or what I call reverse engineering of getting in touch with spirit, our nervous system appears to point into the world with our senses. Mm -hmm. But through meditation, we can reverse it and we can travel the nervous system back into our energy. And when we do that, what happens is that we begin, for example, remembering past life or spiritual ability and our own guidance system that is actually tuned into what we could call the Holy Spirit. For those who don't know what the Holy Spirit is, and I don't mean that strictly in Christian terms, no. Uh, what I mean about the, uh, with regards to the Holy Spirit, in Atlantis, we spoke about the law of one. Right. So all beings who are in a state of love, who are benevolent, they are following the law of one. That means we're all awareness. There's only one ultimately. Right. So, so not to be too picky, let's say to nitpicky about semantics, but there's only one level of awareness, but you have different degrees of consciousness that you can observe from awareness. Awareness is ultimate. You cannot divide awareness into proportions or different levels. Right. Everything is aware. But the question is, what is the consciousness that that awareness is experiencing as a witness? And that consciousness you can evolve, that energy you can evolve. You can up-level your avatar that you're experiencing here, your holographic avatar. Yes, from that awareness, but, but we need to wake up to awareness first to, un to understand, I'm not this body, I'm not this psychology, I'm not the experience of time, of memory and expectation. In fact, memory and expectation is suffering. But we can tune into a higher intelligence, if you will, our higher mind, which is a quantum level of experience, where we simply know things by intuition. It doesn't need struggle. It doesn't need analysis. It doesn't need, um, let's say, any type of, how can I say, self-enhancement. It is on that level of intuition where we simply know certain things. So there, there were those people who were, for, for example, completely aware the injection is not for me. And they didn't know why, but they had an intuitive sense right. from their own guidance system. Ah, I should right. go stay away from this. Right. 
Yeah, but they didn't have an explanation. Well, if I want to give an explanation in that way, at the end of every cycle in human evolution, where we're supposed to either rise or go down, right. graduate or repeat, right. what happens is there will be some sort of catalyst offered that nobody can escape where everybody has to make a decision on. And wasn't it obvious that nobody could escape to make a decision on a certain injection? It was yeah. inescapable by design. So then what is that thing? Well, when I was in, in Nepal two years ago, um, I was meditating with some local young people that came to me. They, they wanted to know about certain mystical practices. And there was a young man who had that injection. And uh, at the time, I wasn't thinking much about it. I just know that this very popular injection wasn't for me. But when I was sitting in meditation, usually if I see a healthy human energy body, I see a frequency from orange to golden. Sure. Yeah, on the, let's say, closest level to the physical, the, on an astral level. Yeah, there's yeah. a there's higher level of energy that we can also investigate, yes. But on an astral level, that's what I saw. Sure. So I looked at his energy and interestingly, where he got the injection in the shoulder, the shoulder turned completely black, uh, an yeah. absence of light. And I saw black strands coming from the shoulder, going to the heart vortex. Yes. And mind you, your heart vortex is what you connect, what connects you directly to the creator. That's right. This is the cosmic breath. There's only one heart and only one breath. That's right. And we truly understand. So black strands were going from the, sh from the shoulder into the heart vortex and the heart vortex was completely atrophied. Yeah. turned black and disconnected the divine guidance system. Right. The so, spiritual center was turned off completely. Yes. 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 So basically what was the injection? An ascension blocker. Ascension blocker. That's exactly right. Yep. I, and I've known that, by the way, all along. I mean, I remember, I mean, mm -hmm. dude, the, the Abraham and, and Esther Hicks, right? Like the, the law mm -hmm. of one people that, you know, glommed on it. They literally sent out a gr video meme saying that, the, the, the vaccine would would uh, uh, turn on your uh, doppelganger and your latent DNA. I mean, it was unbelievable what was going on from the frequencies of darkness and light and how they were even hijacking normally, at least what people thought, you know, were good spiritual values and principles and precepts. So, yes. So you're right. But 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 you're right. Like those of us that were truly conscious slash aware, we knew even if we didn't, we knew. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, there, there might have not been words for it or that right. or there might have not been, uh, let's say I'm, I'm very blessed in the way that when I make inquiries, I get complete downloads Confirmation. of, yeah. Yeah, of, of what certain things do and how they work and how the physics work and so on. Um, so what did you, but, what were you able, what, so with this guy, when you, I mean, where is he like, did, what, are, what are your, what is your summation of that? So are they, are they reachable now or is it like they got to reboot? They got to start over. I mean, I mean, are they savable? I mean, I hate saying savable, but can these people be helped? Depends. I did energy healing work with people who, who took the injection, so to speak. Um, by the way, I, I just accidentally used the, uh, the, the okay. word completely. Yeah, no so problem. No problem. That out. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah. My, my team will get it. No problem. All right. So, um, it, de it depends on the time of injection. If someone, of course, also the question is how many other injections did no, someone get? Yeah. 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 So the more injections, the more nanoparticles and the more foreign objects will be in the system. And what I, what I have seen that it actually attacks the nervous system. Uh, I give you an example. I, I'm, I met a lady who did not take the injection, but had a boyfriend who did. Yeah. And it still evaded her cells. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. When I checked her energetically, what I could see that basically from the from the lower parts of the body, there were black strands moving into the nervous right. system. So it can e even be to some degree transmitted through, through sexual intercourse. And what we can do in my own experience, or let's say uh, what I did with several people who got the injection, I would, with the assistance of, of some divine help, bombard the nanotechnology was a very specific form of frequency that, that breaks the chemical components down. So what we can basically do when we radiate a certain force of angelic power, or let's say divine power, uh, this can be with the help of a deity, for example, that is being summoned or channeled, then 
uh, imagine it like, like uh, being being a laser surgery that you go mm-hmm. through the body on an energetic level and start targeting those particles. But I cannot say if that impacts the re-engineered DNA because obviously the DNA of those beings has been changed. But the technology we can target, the dark energy we can target. But I cannot, from my current experience, not make a long-term prediction a prediction with regards to the people that are helped energetically who got the, uh, a certain popular injection. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just know that they're, that they're still alive and that they're doing okay so far and that their spiritual senses are actually coming back when they practice. But uh, these were mostly people who had like one injection right. and not four. <laughs> well, well, so yeah. let me give you historical context to this mm-hmm. because there's always historical context if we look deep enough, even though the dark sure. side is erasing the past now, as you know, like en masse, right? I mean, even the Mandela effect is very real now because you can look at things that happened that you and I know happened 20 years ago that are now gone. There's no recollection. You can't find it. And again, that's because they're aud- they're aud- auditing and editing the timelines. They're they're going back and going forward and they're attempting to, like you said, block the ascension. That's exactly what is happening. They are attempting to stop the ascension, which as you says, as you said accurately, is an a- event that does happen on a time sequence, you know, in universes, it's probably every 25, 27,000 years. And again, I hate using times because again, I know times don't really matter, but they do in the third dimension. But Julian, this is crazy. But in 1914, the Rockefeller foundation, uh, created the first vaccine first given to us military personnel who, by the way, were drafted. Okay. So again, free will and consent. (laughs) drafted guys going in and taking it. And then what happened is, the, and, and by the way, again, you know, history deep t- tends to repeat itself, Fort Detrick, Maryland, which is where all of the bioweapons now have been proven to be built. So they always make them in the same place. But all of these men took it home to their families. And by 2019, or excuse me, 1919, the Spanish flu had enveloped the entire world. And by t- 1921, and again, it's estimated, but 30% of the global population had died from the Spanish flu. Now, again, 1921, fast forward 100 years, the fourth turning, and they did it again. They literally did it again. 2021 was, you know, the height of the V administration by middle of that year, uh, and also the height of the C, you know, related deaths. And again, as you know, that's all been lied about. We have no idea how many people actually, quote unquote, died from that or didn't die from that. You know, they exterminated so many older people and comorbid people and all of these things. It's all horrible. But uh, it's weird to think about that if we're looking forward and we're looking at historical you know, anal- analogies, then 30 percent. Like it seems like every 100 years, the parasitic forces trim, trim the herd, thin the herd, whatever. And that's kind of the way I look at it right now. And you're right. I mean, there's still a lot of people that uh, haven't, quote unquote, kicked the bucket. But there's a lot of people that are hurting. There's a lot of people. Like if you talk to people in the medical community, most of the people who chose, you know, two or three of them and and maybe two Bs or one B, they're all experiencing autoimmune disorder, dysregulation, disruption. They all have... It's, it's, it's horrible. They have facial yeah. paralysis, upper body paralysis. Mm-hmm. Things are not working. Growths are coming. You know, uh, viruses that they had as children are reemerging. I mean, it's insane. And again, not talked about because we know they control the media. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's my guess is that it's a 30% population curve. And what you saw, you know, with, with the goddess, uh, you know, f- uh, foreshadowing and channeling and connecting with you was, you know, basically the death. You know, and again, remember the death. Yeah, but what, what she showed me, uh, or what I sense from her, is like a 60, 60 to seventy percent population yeah. increase. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. when you uh, when you speak about all these uh, symptoms that are the people are experiencing, uh, imagine this as a form of energetic threshold. When a certain injection is taken, a certain energetic threshold cannot be reached, and therefore uh, those beings are not a frequency match for the higher frequency timeline, which means 
um, that they're karmically entangled with the dark and they have to re-experience going through an ego state and going through reincarnation again for 25,000 years right. before they get another chance to graduate. To graduate, yeah. Right, and that's what's going on. And, and yet we need to understand that the dark is allowed to operate because without the dark operating, again, there would be no evolutionary pressure for, for, for souls to actually return to our original state of being. And uh, in, in the beginning, uh, what you said about the rational the rationalization, and, and let's be clear about this in, in, in terms of psychotherapy or psychology, rationalization is always a justifying of our lower behaviors. Unreal. And we don't want to face our shadow, for example, if we don't want to deal with the f fear of death, so to speak. And someone says, well, you got to take this, otherwise you're going to die. <laughs> and of course, we, we easily manipulate it. No, straightforward then then we operate from the lower energy centers which is which is uh you know which is pain avoidance pleasure seeking and survival that's right. it right right and if we cannot transcend our animal nature yeah or that part of the lower frequency band what what you could call the lower astral realm if we cannot transcend that we fall prey to certain manipulative forces to those forces now, that run that realm yeah Exactly. exactly. And this is this is why in the yogic practices, what any legit yogi will do is to modify one's own energy to such a degree that we're vibrating on a frequency that is not breachable by dark entities. Right. And That's exactly it's right. Important. It's all vibration, Julian. If you're not yes. vibrating at that frequency, they have no power over you, no influence over you, nothing. Exactly. I mean, are you currently suffering from a testosterone deficiency? Are you already using therapeutic testosterone? If you are, go to tottdecoded.com forward slash 10 dash questions and find out the top 10 questions you need to be asking your doctor about therapeutic testosterone. These are critical questions to ask your doctor. If they can't answer them, you need to find another doctor. It's interesting to talk about that because even people like us, if we go out into a field of 100,000 people and they're all in a low frequency, like we can surround ourselves, call it a force field, put a you know, beacon of light, a bubble of light, whatever around us, but you can't do it for long, right? Because like time eventually, like all that negative energy, that starts resonating. It, it, it's so interesting to understand the forces and laws of energy. And, and, and that's why like where you're at, you know, in the wilderness in Peru, you know, creating a spiritual center, that energy that you'll eventually be able to create will be able to, you know, be a, a, a resonant, almost a, a, you know, a vibratory force to, to, to spread out in the areas to help people. But that's why the, you know, you were talking about the major cities. That's why I tell people, you know, again, for those who are tuned to listening to it, you got to get out because those places mm. are literally beacons of dissonance. Like yes. the energy there, you cannot survive as a resonant soul in the center of all of that dissonance without mayhem. Well, I, I would disagree to, to some de degree. Sure. Um, because let's say for the majority of beings that are currently awakening and that and who are not highly trained in, in certain occult practices. Right. And, and usually uh, if some spiritual practitioner comes to me and wants to know about occult practices, I'm like, well, we're not going to go there because of the current state where you still have fear, you're going to turn into a black magician within weeks if, if we go there. We, yeah, because we, we need to overcome our egos first before we can understand what, let's say, we could call white magic or if you want to, higher physics and how to direct energy with our uh, consciousness and our attention and intention. Um, there are beings that are so high frequency, they are not affected by of course. even the deepest point in the matrix. But these are very few. There's right. a very small percentage of, of very advanced practitioners. Yes. For the majority of people, it would be very wise to be very conscious about diet. And what do I mean about 100%. diet? I don't mean only food. I mean, what are you watching? Totally. Uh, are you watching Netflix? Are you watching totally. violence after violence after violence? Are you watching nonstop sex? Are right. you watching uh, or are, are you listening to low frequency music? 
basically every experience that we have in the Maya, in the illusion of Maya is frequency. Yeah. So if we feed ourselves a low frequency diet, for example, if I live right next to, uh, let's say, a, a, a 5G phone tower, and I give you an example of, of, of what I saw uh, in Germany once they activated a 5G tower, is that all the bees in the area, they started dying in a 50 meter radius around the 5G tower. Yeah, and, and when I ask spirit, what's too. happening? Yeah, birds mm -hmm. fall out of the sky from 5G too. Yeah, there you go. And and I wanted to know what's going on. And basically what Spirit told me when, when I was tuning in, they told me that bees have a, a telepathic collective consciousness. And when they go into that frequency field, what happens, they're disconnected from the hive and their nervous system is weaker than the human nervous system. So what happens is they literally forget to breathe and how to fly. And death. And, and they're just stuck there and slowly die. So... We have a lot of radiation that's being used against human consciousness. And uh, I give you an example. When you look at Hollywood productions, what I recently see is a lot of brown and gray filters in movies. Right. Which is a low frequency band. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, violence in, in movies has become more and more graphic and sex has become more and more graphic. What does it do? It constantly stimulates our lower energy exactly. centers. It means we either chasing orgasm To, to avoid anxiety, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Or we're tuning uh, in, into, into a fear frequency band. And it's important that our ego structure, which is ultimately uh, illusionary, gets high on suffering and, and sex. It's insane. And when it gets high on suffering and, and sex, we're not calming our nervous system. We're not going into nature. We're not going into the stillness. Mm -hmm. And what is very important about it is that the more subtle frequencies that are of a higher nature, they are harder to detect because they're less gross, they're less obvious, their appearance is more subtle. So um, in that way, for someone who isn't highly spiritually trained, they, the only uh, psychic sense that nearly every human being has is feeling. So when you go, for example, into a house where, where, where a lot of violence has happened, many people will feel something. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. They will feel goosebumps or whatever. Yeah. So then it is super important to stay away from certain technologies as much as possible. And I remember something that gave me goosebumps. And that was when uh, one of those doctors who was actually awake and speaking out against a certain injection Uh, had a conversation with, with a Muslim lady who took the injection. And the Muslim lady said, I can't hear God anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, heard, I saw that too. Yeah, uh, that was haunting. But I don't mean it in a judgmental way. I'm now speaking uh, from my, let's say, subjective human experience. Ultimately, I know that everything that is going on in the realm of, of relativity, of time, of subjectivity is there to refine our souls so we develop virtue spiritual discipline compassion forgiveness all these attributes that we could not develop if we, if we wouldn't experience antagonism so it's very important not to focus on the antagonism uh, as much um it's it's good that we know what affects us and it's, it's good that we know what is it energetic diet so to speak yeah again not only in terms of food but in, in every form of radiation that we experience And then for, for those people who can sense it in the cities, um, for example, um, last year when, when I was uh, still with my wife in Germany, we felt we had to get out. I had a glimpse of potentially future events. I was sitting at a cafe in Germany in the city of Bonn, and I would see on the astral realm, I would see some sort of black, dark pipes being over every street in the urban areas, And I saw uh, dark AI entities that looked like that, like they were built from black nanoparticles. And I saw that something was reaching out from those pipes into the injected. They were basically being plugged into a grid. And while I was seeing that, I was like, okay, we got to get out of here. <laughs> It's about time. <laughs> right? And... I don't find it important that, that, that people believe me. Like I have no investment in, 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 in an identity that, that I need approval for. 
But uh, I hope that at least what I'm saying can lead to some sort of inspiration and resonance into in those beings who might have doubt about, for example, leaving the system or not leaving the system. And, and maybe to understand that uh, we have been all programmed since we were little children to believe, oh, the system sustains us. The big brother yes. sustains us. The yes. big brother protects us. And then they give us these stories about first world, second world, and, and third world, all this <laughs> nonsense. I'm in Peru. The, the weather is amazing. The air is clean. Yes. The water is clean. The food is clean. Yes. Uh, if we speak about life quality, this is first world. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I'm, and as you know, I'm in Mexico, same thing. Farm to table food, no spraying in the sky, no mm -hmm. pollution. Water, you know, is not the cleanest, but, you know, you can get obviously, you know, very clean water. Um, as I was telling you off air, there's no chemicals here. There's no chemicals being, you know, there's no um, fertilizers or, you know, atrazine or glyphosate or all the stuff that's found in Western Europe and found in the U.S. and Canada. It's it's amazing. If if you don't mind, I want to go a lot, a little bit, deep, not a little bit, but a lot more deeper with you. But re respectful of your time, uh, and kind of maybe define the enemy. You know, you talk a lot about in your meditations. You know, your your uh, Atlantis. Uh, you know, the one recent one you did on Atlantis. You know, talking about reptilian beings and reptilian entities. Obviously, Toth slash Hermes slash Tremestis, whatever you want to call them, talks about the Dark Brotherhood and the Emerald Tablets. Uh, what are, or who are, you know, the, the reptilian density consciousness, like just, just as a basic, you know, summation, you know, and again, I know this is your opinion and up to interpretation and various people have tried to do this. And we all know, you know, from the ancient texts, they talk about the shining ones, uh, you know, Pierre Sabak has written an amazing book called the murder of reality. Talk about, he calls them the Serpentinegua that they have, you know, hijacked the third dimensional frequency realm through the uh, root language of words and etymology and that they control, again, they being whoever, what we want to define as them, uh, they control the frequency of the third dimension. You know, again, they rule through the media, they rule through energy, through music, through entertainment, through Hollywood, through uh, politics, through big pharma, through big agra, through central banking. But can you just, in your opinion, and again, you're a very wise soul, can you kind of define what they are, in, again, in your opinion, based on you know what you've been able to intuit? Hmm. Well, what they are is fear. For sure. Yeah, it, they're basically a concentration of fear. And now, um, what is... One of the main things to realize on the spiritual path is that nobody of us is a, is a victim. That's right. Yeah, when, when you look at the, the leftist politics, for example, in the US, there's a reason it's called identity politics because identity is ego, it's ego politics. That's right. Um, yeah, they, they focus completely on giving away their sovereignty and they're saying where well, there's something outside of me that stops right. me from being who I am, which the is actually not true. The external and savior. Yeah, the external exactly. savior. Yeah. Yeah. External savior or external predator or whatever the excuse is for the condition that we're currently experiencing. Now, who the dark entities are, first of all, there's a, a huge diversity in spectrum of dark entities, but there's also a huge diversity in spectrum of, of light beings. And if there's something to take away from this conversation, it is that we have sovereignty with regards to what we tune into. And the darkness is attractive as long as we believe to be victims because it gives us the rationalization why, why we cannot enter the light. So the, the majority of beings who are actually incarnating are afraid of entering the light. And let's speak about why they are afraid of that. Because if we would do enter the light, we would first become aware of all, let's say, the past life actions or the shadow content or the trauma that we have accumulated over thousands of years. So in Massive. order to face God, we need to face ourselves. Right. This is why spirituality without shadow work is bullshit. <laughs> All right. If someone is not doing shadow work, if it's only mindfulness and if it's only meditation, but there is no shadow work being done. Yeah. There's avoidance present. All right. So um, it's spiritual, very spiritual bypassing. <laughs> yes, exactly. So 
The first thing that we do in spiritual practice is to sit with our pains because our pains are the messengers that tell us why we are out of alignment. And it's very convenient if I have dark forces in an external world that is actually projection of my consciousness, right. by the way. So right. there's an old saying in Zen practice, no inside, no outside. Right. Because it's one. The outside world, the physical reality is a mirror of our energetic cocktail. So whatever I'm experiencing, I can only experience it because I'm a match to it. I'm resonating with it. So if I'm resonating with, for example, an obsession with regards to dark energy, I need to ask myself what type of fear ideology or what type of narcissistic victim identity do I have that I don't focus on the gods, on the angels, on the ascended masters, but on controllers. Yeah. That means I have a desire to be controlled on some level and have some excuse of not entering the light. So that is why when we do this analysis of the dark, which is very necessary, by the way, I'm not saying not to do it, but not to remain there. Once the analysis is done, move into the light. And whatever the energy that is trying to keep us in a fearful belief where we perceive ourselves as narcissistic victims, so to speak, uh, they want to keep us identified in the energy, in, in that type of energy. So if I have any sort of survival reaction towards dark entities, what happens is I'm energizing my ego. Mm -hmm. I'm reinforcing my own prison. And that's really all they can do is try to trick us because that this is what black magic is. Mm -hmm. Black magic is manipulation and it's tried to trick powerful beings that have a connection to source into imprisoning themselves. Right. So once I understand I can only imprison myself, there's nothing that can imprison me outside of myself, can only create the illusion of being imprisoned. Then we go back to agency away from victimhood. And now the question is this, how do I spend my days? Um, focusing on the dark or do I spend my days praying? Do I spend my days speaking, uh, speaking to ascended masters? Do I speak? Uh, do I spend my days meditating and communicating with angels? Do I spend my days, uh, for example, uh, exploring my divine origin and do an archaeology of my energy by turning inward instead of outward? And this mm -hmm. is what the dark does. The dark wants you to turn outward. Right. It wants you to believe the matrix is powerful and it has you by the cojones, so to speak. Yeah. It wants you to believe that. And this is why people get distracted and they're not spiritually practicing. But you need to spiritually practice to get out. This needs to be the main focus. So if the dark is some force from Orion, if it is, let's <laughs> say, uh, uh, let's say a, a certain faction of gray aliens, if it is reptilian, if it is a Anunnaki, all of that does not matter with regards to your energetic sovereignty. Beautiful. I hope that helps. That's amazing, bro. That's a clip to be pushed out to the world right then and there. Exactly. Where you place your consciousness is what you get. Yes. It's literally. Where your intention goes, your energy goes. That's right. So if your intention goes to darkness, guess where you go? So if the your answer, intention goes to, to God, guess where you go? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, to give people answers or, you know, better, you know, deeper solutions relevant to like right now, because let's face it, most people are not meditating or praying, you know, they're, they're focused on their, their phones, news updates, or their, their bank account or their stock portfolio or, you know, whatever else matrix programming, my illusion. It's the, all we have to do is just tell them to opt out. Right. Like I love telling people again, for those that are open to receiving the information that you got to opt out to all of the duality, all of the paradigm narrative programming that they want to feed you through their technological devices. It cannot be a part of your experience. It cannot be a part of your life. It's going back to what you just said. And, and by the way, one of your talking points is matching one's higher self potential timeline. You can do that through spiritual practice, through meditation, through introspection, through contemplation, through sitting in stillness in nature with your dog or by yourself, or whatever, and just observing, and just, again, you know, just being, again, still with your thoughts, still with the monkey mind, still with everything, and it's, it's just, Julian, it's really difficult for most people, because again, they're so entrained 
by you know the narrative. And of course, now, now as you know, the narrative is oh, financial collapse. You know, yeah. this. I mean, that, that, that's the whole point. This is why the catalyst of the dark is there, right. because when uh, when a soul is identified with the body, its main concern is comfort. Right. Yeah, it's right. safety. Is it, yeah, exactly? Isn't that isn't that interesting? Stay safe. Um, <laughs> stay safe. That's what they say. Stay, stay safe, safe was the mantra of those people, wasn't Bro, it? Have you ever said that to anyone in your life? I think. I think yeah. the only time. I, said it, <laughs> I don't know. I think. I, I think I have we said. Stay people, authentic. Stay real. I. I would understand. Well, yeah. Yeah. Of safe. course. But like, I think the only time I've ever said anything like that to somebody, and it hasn't been during the pro the the scandemic, was. I hope you have. I hope you. I hope your travel. I hope you are able to experience travel safely or something like that. You know, but not anything to do with any of this. But you're right. Stay safe. Trust the science. You think of the stay means. safe. If I translate it, sit down and shut up. Right. That's right. It's exactly yeah. right. And and don't oppose us. Stay safe. Go don't along. Oppose us. Get along. Submit. Right. Obey. Mm. Yes. Exactly. And for those who are identified with the body, where the survival. Uh, instinct is dominant um to them that's a trigger now this is why the suffering is there this is why there is a dystopian alternative to the new earth so, so to speak because this dystopian alternative is a catalyst that will provide those people who are very very asleep with such a claustrophobic experience that mm. at some point something in them would want would want to escape if they don't have that suffering how can they search the light? Because otherwise they would just stay comfortable until they die and they would die in ignorance. And dying in, in ignorance is the only real tragedy. Yeah, Whatever we experience as challenge on the physical level, let's say illness, uh, psychological struggle, um, all these things we can use in order to refine our soul to achieve uh, perfection by imprinting ourselves with the experience and then through an uh, alchemical process generating wisdom for it, which leads to soul refinement and ultimately understanding of the law. But for many souls who just enter the body, the amnesia is so total that if they wouldn't experience pain or suffering, they would not seek the light. Right. That's right. So for uh, there is a part for any soul, when they incarnate in this experience, where they learn indirectly through suffering, and at some point when they're awakening, they learn directly from spirits. So suffering is not a prerequisite for expansion anymore. But one needs to be very, very tuned in and fearless in order to penetrate such deeply into spirit. Because when we do, and this is how I experience it, it is in a way the end of free will. Mm -hmm. Because when I tune into spirit and spirit will teach me about certain laws, it will always supersede the intelligence of the brain. So what simply happens, I realize my local, uh, localized mind is minuscule. So when I start tuning into the higher rea reality, so to speak, um, they will supersede my locality. So the locality, the illusion of separate mind and separate human consciousness, then starts dissolving. And then the will of God will begin replacing the separate human will or the experience of personality. Yeah, this is what we could ex experience then as a uh, annihilation or dissolving of the ego where spirit becomes so present in the nervous system that it starts overriding locality, subjectivity, local psychology. And this is exactly why a lot of beings are afraid to step into the light because it means ego death. Now, when right. I when I am identified with my mind and body, I don't want my ego to die because I believe it to be me. Yes, right. And this is why people don't step into the light. It's the same way that uh, I sometimes experience practitioners when I teach them Zen practice, and they begin detaching to such a degree that they can watch their ego like they can watch a movie, and suddenly they experience the fear of death that the ego has. And they stopped meditating. And I said, well, that's a shame. If you would have insisted, you would have entered samadhi. Right. Realization. Watch what dies. It's unreal. It's not you. But for most people, when the psychology is throwing a fit or creates a drama, they abort practice. And this is why people don't realize freedom. Well, what's the type of freedom that, that people actually looking for? They're looking for freedom from pain. Right. 
That's right. They're not looking for spiritual freedom. They're not looking for letting go of the narcissistic locality and say, well, I let God do my thinking for me. I let right. the Holy Spirit replace my dysfunctional belief system and let me teach the law of love. Because from that moment on, I can't be a coward if I'm in touch with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is teaching me. Um, I have moments where, let's say, you know, uh, I get up in the morning and uh, maybe for some reason, subjectively, I'm not feeling very, very well. And suddenly, holographically, one of my teachers manifests in front of me and cracks a joke. And I like, I wanted to be serious, but I can't. <laughs> right, right. Because they're not letting me. They're not letting me because they love me, as they love all of us. So when, once we enter love, we suddenly begin co-creating by becoming an, an, an extension of the creator. And then suddenly we realize our inner Christ nature. We realize our inner Yeshua, our Gandhi, our Martin Luther King. And suddenly we can't be cowards. Right. And this is what people are afraid of, to get past the selfishness and to actually be of service and to be targeted then by the dark That's for right. being of service. And this is, by the way, that uh, might be quite interesting. When I went through my own Kundalini process, um, my own teachers explained it to me like this, that the human frequency band that most people in the matrix exists on is very low. So if you would look at it from a satellite, you would see all these people, they, they would all look very similar. But when someone is awakening and they practice some form of higher energy yoga, they light up like a light bulb, right? So everything from the astral planes is suddenly attracted to you like a moth to the flame, demons as well as angelic beings. And then the wrestling match over the soul of the, of the one who is being initiated begins. The dark tries to pull you into the black magic. The light tries to pull you into the white magic. And then the game is on. Then suddenly there's a conscious evolution of interacting with, this, with, with these realms of physics. And this is exactly what people are afraid of, that once their energy increases, and they're about to step into the light that the victimhood, the comfort, the sense of self that they had previously cannot survive. It will be deconstructed. Are you using therapeutic peptides? Are you a new user, maybe an advanced user? Maybe you're considering starting peptides. Highly recommend going to the link right below the peptidescourse.com forward slash 10 dash mistakes and download my PDF and learn what not to do before starting therapeutic peptides. Yeah. Well, I can listen to you speak all day, man. This is such a blessing for me. I'm so privileged. I mean, it's this podcast is so profound. Let me just ask you, because people will always ask me sometimes after I have an amazing person like yourself on, and I haven't had that many people like you, I have to say, um, what is a day like, what is a day in the life of Julian Ponzin? And also, please tell me more about your spiritual monastery that you're building. Like, how can people find out more about it, um, you know, if they want to move? And, you know, because a lot of people are going to watch this podcast and they're going to be deeply moved. And they're going to be like, I want more of Julian Ponzin. I, I, I want to learn from him. I want him to mentor me. I want, you know, to, to be taught by him. If there's a way that obviously you can do that, you know, please share with that. But I, I'm definitely interested in like, what does a day in the life of Julian Ponza look like right now, like in Peru? This is sometimes difficult to describe because I'm not experiencing myself on 3D plane only. Right. So uh, if you could imagine this, uh, imagine you have, let's say, five or six different TV screens and they're all on at the same time. So what can happen is that I have a very human experience that like anybody else, I make myself breakfast, you know, I go to the <laughs> toilet, I take a shower. Uh, uh, I might have a, a little bit of a, a, sometimes an argument with my lovely wife on, on that level. I'm, I'm experiencing a, a humanness like anybody else, but at the same time, I'm present in other dimensions in other levels. So when I meditate, it can be, for example, that I merge mind with uh, enlightened beings and I have a dialogue with them and they would explain to me, for example, certain holy scriptures or practices. Uh, in some way, I could meditate and you would look at me from the outside, nothing is happening. 
it would appear completely boring. But in my own experience, I might merge with a, a yogi from the Himalayas and he would show me a certain breathing techniques, a technique or how to move energy in a certain way and modify my nervous system. Or, uh, for example, I have experiences uh, where, uh, <laughs> I experience, um, where I experience uh, many teachers in, in the Holy Spirit and they have a great sense of humor. I, if you don't mind, I, I give you I give you a little joke that a Please. certain being that yes. uh, many people are very familiar with <laughs> made recently to me. So uh, one of the beings that I'm experiencing is Alan Watts. Oh, yeah, and sure. we have a deep connection in terms of the tradition of Zen. Uh, he had lifetimes in China, in China where, he, where, he, where he was actually a Zen Buddhist teacher and I experienced meeting him and so on. And one time he, he said to me, Julian, you, you know that God is having a hard time? And I asked, why? And he said, because God is a single parent. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Right. And uh, hilarious. So, I, the way I experience relationship is very multidimensional. I could chant a mantra and I would, for example, merge with the consciousness of a deity. For example, uh, often I experience visions from uh, Ganesh or Kali. And uh, one time, one of my uh, teachers in spirit, which is, which is Yogananda, uh, he said to me, well, Julian, once you start merging with the deities, you, what you experience is the eye of God. You see reality through the eye of God. So if that makes sense to you, what I'm practicing is doing the splits. Mm -hmm. Being fully present in my human body and relating to people directly, compassionately. But at the same time, I experience myself in other dimensions that are so detached and so far removed from human experience in general. That, that is, by the way, a proper understanding of the middle way is to do the splits, that you're able to reside in the realm of higher physics and basically tap into the God mind, while at the same time you're relatable on a human level and are able to transmit this higher knowledge in such a way that it is, uh, let's say, com comprehensible to some degree, inspiring to some degree, yeah, moving to some degree. So what I'm striving for is, on the one hand, to not be in resistance to being human. And on the other hand, not to be so detached that I lose compassion towards people. <laughs> and that, that's a very challenging process, not I can say. Not easy to do, my friend. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I mean, in your meditation, because, and I'm not at your level, but there has been times where I've actually deeply questioned, you know, from a higher self perspective of like, why would I want to come back? Mm. Right. Like what purpose is there for me to go back into the, in the, into the 3d body realm, ma you know, material, Maya, whatever you call it, matrix existence when I can be here. So, I mean, do you, do you feel sometimes, um, like not coming back? I mean, I know you call it the splits. I love that. But like, has there been times, you know, cause I've spoken to people, some similar people to you, like, uh, Dr. Udo, Dr. Udo Erasmus, the guy that founded essential fatty acid oils. I mean, he sits for 14 to 16 hours now a day in deep, you know, forms of meditation. He, he does a bunch, bunch of them. He, I, I, I'll send you one of the podcasts. You and him should actually do a podcast together. I don't know if anybody would speak. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. But like, I mean, he's a profound guy like you. And, uh, you know, he, he, when I asked him that question, he said, he didn't say anything for like 10 seconds. And then he eventually mm. said, one time, like that to me, you know, <laughs> to let me know that it did, you know, come across that it was part of his deal. But do you, do you kind of feel like that's your spiritual mission, so to speak now, to be this bridge, this guy splitting so that, like you said, you can offer your wisdom and counsel to people who are receptive to it right now? Well, um, Here's the difficulty about knowing who you are. Um, the memories that I have, they're reaching so far back. I remember, I remember teaching uh, many lamas in Tibet. I remember being a, a guru in India in, in two lifetimes consecutively. And um, the difficulty about this, and this is something that is really difficult to talk about 
for those of us who are returning willingly, not because of karma, right. but because, well, that's the idea of the Bodhisattva, the Buddha that is returning to be the lighthouse to bring the other ships into the harbor if they want to follow the light. Right. Because there needs to be a representation of the divine realms on earth at all times for those souls who want to break out of, out of the matrix. But I will also tell you that uh, maybe some spiritual teachers might find it difficult to speak about, but there is a weariness. Yeah, there is a course. tiring. And I feel that very deeply in myself sometimes because, uh, as an example, uh, one time I was sitting with my wife in, in a park in Germany and uh, and she, she had a vision of uh, one of my lifetimes in India uh, where people were jumping over the walls and over the fences to get to me. So they can talk to me. And I had no privacy. I was constantly yeah, followed course. by practitioners and, and devotees. There was no room for me whatsoever. And there's a certain claustrophobia about that. Um, but this is, in a way, the, the sacrifices that we make by transcending the human needs or the, the, the human self-centeredness. But it leads also to a tiring of the soul. And there is a point where, where even uh, enlightened beings do not return anymore because they either take on higher responsibility uh, responsibilities in higher realms, but there's also teaching, by the way. It's not like you leave your body, you are in spirit, and you suddenly uh, know it all. This is not how it goes. There's a lot of teaching going on in higher dimensions and certain practices ongoing. I have, and, to ask, uh, I have to ask you something about what you just said, though, because it really resonated deeply with me. And I'm not saying that we're in the same wavelength, but I think we are. Do you have bouts of like, Throughout your life, as you've become, you've remembered, let's say, who you are, have you had moments, or not moments, but just periods of depression because of the weariness? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Too. It's unreal. Uh, simply also because of the responsibility. Yes. Because when I started remembering uh, who I am, uh, there's a weight to it. There's also a lightness to it in a way that you have a great faith and great determination because you know oh i i did it several times That's already right. right like i reached that level of practice and i've been teaching thousands and thousands of people I've written i don't know hundreds of books uh mystical practices in, in my other lifetimes and so obviously there's a knowing of i can do it again but at the same time there's also this tremendous momentum of karmic force that you know there's no escape from the fate that a self-created fate, if you will, because all these energies that I've put out in other lifetimes, they are relentless. Yes. They will rip me out of the body and rip me into other states, and I have no choice about it in such a way. If I would try to have choice about, about it, I would have to go against my nature and be miserable. Yeah. So in that way, uh, imagine that that you're on a roller coaster and the That's only exactly thing that you can what do I was is just say. It's a roller coaster, like where you have, un I mean, it's so crazy, man. This is like connecting with me so deeply because like, I know you've experienced the same thing where you like have a day where your creativity is through the roof and your energy is just unreal and you're so connected. And then literally the next morning you wake up and you're like, what happened? Right? Like you just go from like the most amazing high mm -hmm. to just being completely devoid of any kind of energy. And, and uh, wow, it's amazing. My my whole life has been like this, my brother. And and do you? I, I want to ask you. Do, do you? Um, is your family? Do you have? Is is your family mostly asleep, or do you have like blood relatives in this current incarnation that are awake? No, nothing. Um, yeah, this so very important. The family that, structure, yeah, is also part of the system. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. I don't know, uh, let's say, most beings that reach a high spiritual level usually completely disconnect from their families. Exactly. There are very few high-level spiritual beings who would maintain those relationships. And, and, and I give you a little bit of, of a metaphor, uh, and this metaphor come, comes from Master Yeshua. Um, I had a student here in Peru who was corrupt, and he was playing power games with the team. So we had to remove him from the team because he was in a fear state. And what we're doing here is love and not fear. Sure. And, but I felt a certain grievance about it. And then uh, we had a, a team meeting where we, where we were eating in a restaurant and suddenly uh, Yeshua was merging his mind with me. And he said, Julian, look at it this way. 
uh, if you are on a horse and you have a very important message to deliver that is probably going to uh, save the life of thousands of beings or, or let's say ease the suffering of thousands of beings and you're riding very fast and you see there's a farmer who has a wooden cart and it's stuck in the mud, you are hard because your compassionate wants to say, I want to get off the horse and help the farmer pull the cart out of the mud. But from a higher level of compassion, you understand you need to deliver the message. So you yes. need to let the farmer be. Yeah. And what I've seen with many mystical practitioners, or sometimes if I if I'm if I'm if, if I'm a little bit you know you know uh, let's say spreading some snarkiness, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I would say uh, there's such a phenomenon that I call light worker light. Is when it's all love and light, but there is a fear of actually stepping out. There is a fear of actually not being nice. There's a fear of being real and actually. Uh, a fear of offending, offending or alienating someone. people with yeah. truth. So, yeah. so there is a fake friendliness and a fake compassion, which is actually uh, self-pity. And um, when we are in a situation where, for example, the family is dysfunctional or they're in a low-frequency state, who are we to be such narcissists as to say, I use my family as a scapegoat right. To weigh myself down so I cannot be of service to the, the to the degree that I could be of service. Yes, there's a great selfishness in that, and I've seen this with many people. Yeah, and honestly, bro, like you have to you have to detach, you have to yeah. remove yourself from that, which I have done. And again, you know, I mean, when when you get to a specific level, and again, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter their thought waves. It doesn't matter their frequencies. I mean, you are on your mission. If you're attuned and you're connected to through the mind of God, you know what you're supposed to do. And yes, you're going to have roller coasters. And yes, you are still in a physical body and you are still subject to the laws of the third dimension. But it doesn't matter. But it is interesting because as I talk to more and more people like you, we all have the same story, man. We're all literally born into families, which obviously we choose, uh, which have zero or less than spiritual awareness. Uh, because again, it's it's the great contrast for us to evolve, you know, as quickly as we can from the illusion of Maya, from the veil of forgetfulness to get where it is intentionally that, you know, source slash the you know, ascended masters, God, the angelics, you know, desire us to go. Well, it's it's also a form of karma yoga where, for example, high-level beings say, Well, I'm gonna be born in a very unconscious family. So I don't give the karma to the next generation. I'm going True. to break the cycle and whoever comes after me doesn't have to receive those energies and then be born with a certain veiling, you know? So, um, and, there, and there's even a deeper degree to that. And, and I think may, maybe maybe it helps if, if I also share some some of my of course. Uh, darker experience because yeah. it's, it's not it's not all roses and sunshine. No, on absolutely the not. Path. Quite, the, uh, quite the opposite. There, there are tremendous challenges. So one time in meditation, I had a conversation with, with Yogananda about this. Uh, I asked him, uh, because I remember my past life, I, uh, past lives, I asked him, why did I have to be born in the West and be so deeply traumatized and get through the ma matrix, get through, through the mental health system, uh, have to struggle myself or claw myself upward from a pit of darkness? Why couldn't I have been born in India to a spiritual family or, or, or in Tibet? Like, in a, like, why couldn't I, I have like been surrounded by by monks from an early age? Why did I have to go through all this unconsciousness? And then he said to me, "Well, Julian, we needed to have a yogi that is tough as nails that will go into the matrix, yeah, and then transmute it from inside out to be the example life, and then demonstrate it to the people." And now he said, you have compassion for the Westerner. You understand how they think, how they feel, how they speak, because you have been immersed in that, even though, even though now you're detached from it, you have been immersed in that and you know what the sufferings that they're going through. If, if you would have been born in India, you would have to learn English. There would be a cultural barrier. You would have to travel over there. But now you basically from inside out, have transformed this and you can teach it to people in a language that they can relate to. Beautiful. I hope that makes sense in terms of spiritual service. Totally makes sense. It's amazing. How old were you when that happened in this incarnation? What exactly now? No, that, that, in that meditation, 
with Yogananda? Like, was that recently or was that That's probably back? two years ago? No, it's not so it's more recently. recently. So, so but these, like, these type, uh, I want to be clear on the matter. These type of communications aren't special. No, yeah, no, I understand. They, that. they might appear to people special. It, it is just simply that once we add a certain energy frequency, with which everybody can be achieve yes. can achieve if they're determined. Won't yes. be clear on the matter. There's nothing special about me. In fact, that's the whole point of, of Buddha nature is to display university qualities and not individual ones as much. And um, so these communications with these beings that can happen on a daily basis for you will be really tuned in. And, and I would even say um, the information is freely accessible to any of us when we learn to remember it, as you, were, you, you mentioned it, but as I like to say, when we're actually in tune or connected with our higher self. I mean, it's literally our higher self will guide us through our life as long as we're able to listen, you know, to that frequency. Um, and, and yes, anything is accessible. I, I, I know when I'm in my most quote unquote spiritually aware state or self from a, you know, let's say it's a really good morning meditation. Uh, and then I have a podcast or a conversation with somebody that I don't even know much about the topic, but as I'm speaking to this person who usually is an expert in what they're talking about, which is would be that topic, I'm able to converse with them at their level. And it's like, I remember one time a man that I did a podcast with, he's a quantum physicist, asked me at the end of our podcast, because he never interrupted me during the podcast. He was like, where did you go to school? And where did you, how do you know those things? And I literally just looked them straight in the eye and said, I just, I, I download them straight from the universe. Or they're downloaded into my mind when I'm speaking yeah. to someone, when I'm at that wavelength. And that is what you just said. It's an absolute fact that any person can assess these levels of awareness when you do the work necessary to get there. It's literally that yes. And the work to get there, um, it's important to understand the karma yoga of this. The karma yoga is very simple. Everything that you are afraid of, you need to do. Right. <laughs> yeah, because, because fear is the illusion of ego. That's, That's right. what it is. Yeah, right. fear says, I don't want to expand. I don't want to go out today. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to meditate because I don't want to feel what I'm going to feel if I meditate. So uh, obviously the uh, fear cannot survive in love. That's right. But how to become loving or how to remember what love is like. And this is something in my own process, in my yogic process, when I started perceiving ascended masters and speaking to them on a daily basis, this is where I was really uh, sometimes touched and overwhelmed. And I would sit in meditation and tears would run down my face. It's simply because once we remember and we tune into the, these levels of what a higher reality is and how God is and how the angels are and how ascended masters are, there's this overwhelming sense of love and and I think this is something that, that we relate to you very much, but you have this overwhelming sense of love, but the reality that we experience on the subjective physical level does not represent that. No. The contrast is so immense. So uh, the challenge for any practitioner is like when we feel that sense of love and compassion and we know we are immortal beings, there's nothing that we ultimately need to fear. We still live a life in relativity and, and at the same time need to master our human bodies in order not to be caught up in the suffering or in the drama. And uh, that is actually what the mastery is about. Like once you are awake, wonderful, you are awake, but you're still going to be expanding and refining yourself. And even enlightened beings do not stop learning. Right. That's right. They constantly expand. They constantly learn. That's so, the hard, by the way, that's the hardest thing to explain people who are so caught up in the quote unquote Abrahamic religious paradigm the source is not this great omniscient being sitting on a golden chalice in the sky, you know, that, that even source created the universe to evolve itself. I mean, it's a never ending process. Now, now you've touched on something that is very, very important, immensely important because you said before, well, if a being is, for example, realized, why would they return to a body? Because they are suffering. There's misery. Why would someone return to a body after that? Well, ironically, for God, and when I say this to people, they, they're like, 
who is this guy and why <laughs> why is he like so so outrageous and making statements like that if i tell people that god doesn't know who he is it would you know the, depending on what religious belief they have there would be outrage of course god knows he is he's all god is perfect. well why does god create a universe that is basically a, a wisdom generator or an right. ascension engine where god creates the illusion of fractalizing and then going through an illusion of time to rediscover himself Learn. if he would know himself. And this is exactly what we're doing. And this might be quite interesting. Uh, one time during meditation practice, what I experienced was some of the earliest memories of God. And most people will not believe it, but that is fine. So what I basically saw is that we were void complete emptiness. And the only thing that we were was aware. We had no time. We had no border. We had no way of perceiving ourselves because we had no attribute. Right. And then we started building very basic geo geometrical figures from very primitive form of atoms. And we were amazed at creating pyramids and cubes and spheres. It's like a child that is in the kindergarten and is stacking blocks on each and on right. Yeah, uh, building, let's say, houses with blocks and then tearing them down again. And we would build these geometrical figures, which you now know as sacred geometry. And we would tear them down again, reassemble. And then there was one thought in the, let's say, in the oneness that, that, that we are, we want to love. Mm -hmm. This was our first desire. We want to love, but there's no object of love right. because we are one. And we cannot have a relationship with ourselves and we cannot perceive ourselves. So what, so what do we do? And then we had the idea, what if we place a part of our consciousness in the object? Right. And then we would perceive our unlimited self from limitation. So in a way for the human to return to the ultimate is enlightenment, but for the ultimate to become human is enlightenment. That's the fusion. Right. of spirit and individuality. So we created individuality in order to have relationship because it was impossible to us in the beginning. And we we didn't have an object that we could project our love onto. And then we started experimenting. What would it be like to forget that we are who we are? And then slowly through a form of reverse engineering, which you could call the spiritual process, rediscover ourselves and reappreciate ourselves. And through that process, we would paint an image of ourselves to get an idea of who we are. And every being in the cosmos that is reincarnating is painting an individual image from their perspective of God. And this is how God gets to know himself. Beautiful. Right? This is why we get born. To serve God in knowing himself. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so hard to speak that to people who are not open to receiving that. But yeah. They well, love them either way because they're you. Exactly. Holographic fractals of the source. Exactly. Yes. yes. Man, Julian, this has been such an amazing podcast, man. If uh, If somebody wants to work with you, podcast with you, connect with you, uh, you know, in, in, in today's day and age, as time gets more and more interesting, what is the best way they can do that? Well, they simply can go to my website. Well, what I offer there is online sessions for, for those who want to maybe receive a channeling or spiritual teaching, learn about yogic systems of realization. Uh, they can go to my website. It's www.julian-polzin.de. Um, I also offer group sessions. We do them once once a month. It's basically it's our satsang. We come together with, with maybe 10, 10 to 20 people, uh, depending on uh, who shows up that day. So there are group sessions, there are individual sessions. If someone wants to be uh, wants to make a podcast with me, all my contact info is on my website and just write me an email. Uh, if it resonates with what what I do, um of course, uh, it would be joyful for me to co-create with any being who's part of the solution or part of the Christ stream, if that makes sense to you. Sure. 
Um, at the same time, I need to be careful that I keep practicing and I'm not too occupied and doing too many podcasts. So, yeah. so uh, I hope that uh, beings understand if I will be selective uh, depending on what I'm also supposed to do spiritually. Yeah, but anybody can contact me and um, highly likely is going to get a response from me. So. Julian, amazing, man. Again, I'm so grateful. I send so much love from my heart to your heart. Um, thank you. This has been an honor. I mean, absolutely. This is such a profound podcast. I mean, I cannot wait to get this out to the world, uh, which I will do very, very quickly. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, for all the amazing folks that do watch, uh, the Jay Campbell podcast, as always support the amazing individuals that come on like Julian, uh, visit his website, which will be obviously in the show notes and right below this video. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.